I want to open this session on climate change, past, present, and future by quickly summarizing a wealth of geologic information showing that basaltic lava flows over time have occurred contemporaneous with major warming, whereas major explosive volcanoes have been contemporaneous with slow cooling. And there's this interchange of these two volcanoes that can explain in great detail climate change throughout all of Earth history. Now these data are from the just borehole in uh, Summit, Greenland, and for the last 25,000 years. The green shows the oxygen isotope proxy for temperature. The red is volcanic sulfate per century, or a proxy for how much volcanism is going on. And what stands out immediately is coming out of the last ice age, the major period of warming coincides with a major period of volcanism. In fact, it's the most intense and longest lasting period of volcanism recorded in all of Greenland ice. When I found this back in 2006, I said, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. We all know that major explosive volcanoes like Pinatubo cool the earth for about a half a degree centigrade for two to four years. It's well observed. So I started out saying, what could be going on here? Now, when basaltic lava comes out under ice, it has to build vertically up through the glacier. It doesn't spread under the ice. And what's formed are these table mountains, uh, shown in the upper left, or Tuya in Iceland. And when we look at the distribution of these tuya over time, and we calculate the ages uh, from helium-3 exposure ages of when they were last active, we find that 12 of the 13 uh, best dated tuyas were active during the bowling and pre-boreal warming periods. And what's very important here is to notice that it took 2,500 years of major basaltic volcanism to warm the ocean out of the last ice age. It's clear during the bowling warming, we had a lot of volcanism and it lasted for quite a while, but it wasn't enough to warm the ocean. If you don't warm the ocean, when you stop having the volcanism, the ocean pulls you back down into the ice age again. The heat content of the ocean is very large and very important in determining climate long term. Now this is data also from the same ice core, the last 125,000 years. And what you notice here, we're measuring air temperature, and there were 25 times when there was very sudden warming within a year, certainly within a decade, followed by slow incremental cooling over time. The footprints of climate change, therefore, in a recording like this, where we have very good detailed layering and detailed dating and detailed course correlation, are erratic sequences of rapid warming followed by slow incremental cooling over millennia. The green line here shows ocean temperatures, and you can see again the difference between air temperatures, which are changing very, very rapidly, and the record that we get when we look at benthic cores uh, in the oceans. So what is it that causes this rapid warming? I'm going to argue it's depletion of the ozone layer. When you deplete the ozone layer, more ultraviolet B reaches Earth. Ultraviolet B burns your skin. It's the hottest radiation from sun to reach the Earth. Humans caused depletion of the ozone layer from 1970 to 1998, when they started producing chlorofluorocarbon gases, or CFCs, shown here in green. And as the concentration of those in the atmosphere rose, ozone depletion increased and temperature increased. When we discovered the Antarctic ozone hole in 1985, we realized, wow, this is a bigger problem than we thought. And within two years, scientists and politicians passed the Montreal Protocol which restricted the production of CFC gases. And this took effect in January of 1989. Well, sure enough, by 1993, the increase in CFC stopped. By 1995, the increase in ozone depletion stopped. By 1998, the increase in temperature stopped. From 1998 to 2014, there was the well-known global warming hiatus where temperatures did not change much. Then in 2014, suddenly it started warming at five times the rate from 1970 to 1998. And I'm going to explain in a few minutes that that was from a basaltic volcanic eruption. The black line shows the annual average ozone recorded at Arosa, Switzerland since 1927, when the first records were collected. And what you can notice is every year there's a fair variety in the average. And in fact, ozone is changing all the time. But these averages turn out to be quite indicative. 
And up until about 1970, there was very little change in the average ozone. But then, with the increase in CFCs shown in green going downward, there was a depletion of the ozone layer and an increase in ocean heat content. Ultraviolet B penetrates oceans at least 100 meters. So all of that radiation goes directly into ocean heat content. So 30-year increases of CFCs led to ozone depletion, led to decreasing lower stratospheric temperatures in purple, shown up above, and led to increasing ocean heat content. What's interesting is the two greatest periods of greatest depletion were following the eruption of Pinatubo and following the eruption of AF Fjallajökull and Grunsvatn in Iceland in 2010. Volcanic eruptions led to major ozone depletion and it typically lasted for less than a decade, as you can see, following the Pinatubo eruption. So what we have is two very distinctly different kinds of volcanism. Major explosive volcanic eruptions that cause net cooling and major effusive flows of basaltic lava that cause net warming. The explosive eruptions are typical above subduction zones, which are so when ocean plates are moving quickly, you get a lot more of these kind of eruptions. They form aerosols in the lower stratosphere that reflect sunlight, scatter sunlight, causing about a half a degree centigrade cooling for two to four years, depending on the size of the eruption. But they also caused warming. This shows in the Pinatubo erupted in June of 1991, and during December to February, there was warming of as much as 3.5 degrees centigrade in the northern hemisphere in industrial areas. When we look at the effect of the cooling on the ocean, this is some modeling done for Krakatau in 1883, and where it was assumed the ocean was cooled a half a degree centigrade for three years, you can see the effects still 100 years later of that on ocean temperature. And so what we have is when you have multiple eruptions, say three, four, five a century, that are large enough to have this effect, you increment the world cooler with each eruption. And when this goes on for tens of thousands of years, that increments you into an ice age. And if you go back to my 125,000 year diagram, you can see it being incremented lower and lower and lower into the ice age. On the major basaltic lava, on the other hand, this is typical of severial rift zones, like Iceland, the East African Rift. It emits a lot of chlorine and bromine, causing ozone depletion and rapid warming. We're not exactly sure of the chemical path, but we observe the depletion and we know that basalts uh, emit 10 to 100 times more chlorine and bromine than more developed magmas. The climate effect is determined by the aerial extent, which depends on the duration of the eruption. Barthabunga in 2014 in central Iceland covered an area of 85 square kilometers in six months. This was the largest basaltic eruption since 1783, and it caused 2016 to be the hottest year on record. 2017 is cooler, 2018 was cooler, and I would predict in the future uh, we should be getting cooler unless there's more of these kinds of eruptions. But if we look at the other end of the extreme, the Siberian traps 251 million years ago covered 7 million square kilometers. That's equivalent to 91% of the United States. Just imagine basalt going from San Francisco to New York to Miami to Seattle. And this went on for at least 100,000 years and probably more, uh, longer. So the Siberian basalts were coincident with the biggest mass extinction we have in the geologic record. Oceans became 40 degrees centigrade. That's hot tub temperature, 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Major acidity in the oceans. This happened at the end of the Paleozoic, one of the major changes in the geologic time scale. The Central Atlantic Magmatic Province at 201 million years ago, when North America and Africa started moving apart. That was the end of the Triassic. The Deccan basalts in India, 66 million years ago, covering a half million square kilometers. That was at the end of the Mesozoic, and they all were associated with major mass extinctions, major ocean acidity. Now, if we look at just the last 10,000 years in the Holocene, the green line is again from the ice cores in Greenland. It's a proxy for temperature. And what you notice is there are very sharp times when the temperature is much higher than others. And it turns out in many of these, we see associated with them major lava flows, major basaltic lava flows that covered seven, eight hundred, nine hundred square kilometers. 
The craters of the moon in central Idaho and the Snake River Plain caused uh, the Roman warm period. Each of the major warm periods that we can see, we see a very close correlation. And what's interesting is that when we look at these periods, the ones I just showed you, and uh, those are the ages of major flood basalts, and compare them with the ages of mass extinctions, we find a very linear relationship. And what's interesting is they typically end geologic eras, periods, and epochs. Now on the geologic time scale over the last several hundred years, geologists have been mapping sudden changes in environment, sudden changes in fossils. And what we're finding now is that many, many of these sudden changes are contemporaneous with major basaltic lava flows. Richard Ernst wrote a three inch thick book on large igneous basaltic provinces, and he looked and identified more than 200 of them. I'm only showing 17 here. And also notice that in blue there are several ice ages, and these also seem to have an effect of change in certain changes in geologic time. So the balance of effusive volcanism, basaltic volcanism, versus explosive volcanism appears to be driven by plate tectonics, where you have the most subduction or when you have the most rifting going on. And it's when you have uh, a lot of subduction going on, as for example, around the Pacific Ocean in the last several million years, that's what got us down into the last ice age. So conclusions for this session are Throughout geologic time, the footprints of climate change are highly erratic sequences of rapid warming within years, followed by slow incremental cooling over millennia. On average, over the last 125,000 years, they average about every 3,000 years, but they are clearly not cyclic. Rapid warming is contemporaneous with effusive basaltic lava flows covering tens to millions of square kilometers that are observed to cause ozone depletion. Humans also caused warming from 1970 to 1998 by manufacturing CFC gases observed to deplete the ozone layer. Slow incremental cooling over millennia is contemporaneous with sequences of several major explosive eruptions per century that form aerosols in the lower stratosphere reflecting and scattering sunlight. So the observed climate change throughout Earth history is explained much more accurately and in much greater detail by changes in explosive versus effusive volcanism rather than changes in greenhouse gases. Now in a 13 minute talk, I can't begin to give all the evidence for that, but I would say I can now show that greenhouse gas theory is physically impossible. There's a mistake in the physics, a mistake in the mathematics. And my fundamental conclusion today is that substantial warming in the future is not anticipated unless there are very rare major basaltic lava flows. Thank you.